um, Alex, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so we have pointed the camera uh, towards the students. Are you able to see them? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so let's start this session. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I think most of you know me. My name is Professor Shomodit Roy. I teach economics here at JSBF. Uh, we are delighted to have Professor Alex Thomas today. Uh, he's going to speak about the politics of microeconomics. Uh, Professor Thomas is an assistant professor at the School of Arts and Social Sciences in Azim Premji University, uh, which is in Bangalore. Uh, we are, me and Professor Kanti are both teaching economics one course from the core textbook, as all of you know. And Professor Alex has written uh, a textbook on macroeconomics, uh, which is revolutionary in its own way. And he's going to talk about, uh, you know, how mic microeconomics has been taught so far and how it kind of should be taught uh, in the future. So I'll hand it over to Professor Kranti to formally introduce uh, Professor Alex. Hi, Alex. Firstly, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you. So for me, uh, I know Professor Alex. When I was studying my undergraduate days, he had come and taken a guest lecture for us. And ever since I've been following, so he writes a blog, Undergraduate Economist. And after that, he did his PhD at University of Sydney. So he's a political economist. Um, I've taught, told at least some of you what political economy is. So earlier, this micro macro distinction was not there as I mean, as economics originated, right? It's only later that the separation had come. So today, I think Professor Alex will talk to you about, first of all, it's called politics of microeconomics, because in class, we have discussed about the assumptions that we make in microeconomics and how some of you have raised a concern that you know, ma'am, but this is not how the real world works, right? Some of you had those kind of questions and stuff. So now uh, it's time for you to kind of dig deeper and know about the politics of microeconomics. And that's what he'll talk about. And he'll also kind of give you a picture about the history of economic thought um, or how it has evolved, at least about the marginalist economics. And if you guys have any questions during the session, clarificatory questions, you can of course pause and ask. But uh, I would appreciate if you keep them to the end. If you have any major questions, we can take them towards the end. Uh, is that okay with you, Alex? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But if you have any doubt, uh, to go go ahead. Please raise your hand, and you can always ask. Okay. So thank you so much, and over to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, professors uh, Kranti and Shomadip uh, for having me here. And I must say that this is a bit weird because so far I've done webinars and, you know, everybody has been in front of a laptop screen. So today I think only me and a few others are in front of laptops and all of you are uh, viewing it, uh, I mean, away from a laptop. So anyway, let, we'll see how it goes. Um, so let me just share my screen. Is the screen, uh, is the slide audible, uh, viewable? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. it's visible, it's visible, yeah. All right. So I just wanted to start off by talking a little bit about how I came to this lecture or how I uh, ended up uh, wanting to talk about this. So in 2011, and uh, Kranti had also mentioned this blog post or the blog that I have where I'd written in 2011, something which was titled exactly the same, The Politics of Microeconomics. Uh, almost more than 10 years ago. And the, the rationale for writing about it was at that time, some students had walked out of a class taught by ManQ. Now, as many of you would probably know that ManQ is a famous uh, economist who has written a, a many famous textbooks, but the principles of economics being some of the, uh, the most best-selling book. So this was a context in which I wanted to get into what microeconomics is about, a little bit about its history and so on. And recently, recently, as in the last year, I wrote another uh, blog post trying to talk about the merits of pluralism in economics. And I particularly spoke about, uh, I wrote about microeconomics. So that's the broader context in which I'm going to uh, make today's lecture. So if, if you are a student of microeconomics, you will know that there are many books in the market on microeconomics. So there is ManQ, there is Varian, there is Ahuja, there's, you know, there are, there are other textbooks in the market. 
I haven't mentioned core here, but I think that if there is a discussion that comes up at the end in the q and I'm happy to talk about core as well. So for now, let's just take a look at these textbooks that I've put up here. And the question to ask is, is there only one microeconomics? Sorry, there's a plane just flying above. So the question to ask is, is there just one microeconomics or are there many microeconomics? From the textbooks, it would appear that there's only one kind of microeconomics. And I'm calling it marginless microeconomics because if you look at all these textbooks and even I think a core textbook to a large extent uses these marginal concepts. So they could be marginal utility, marginal rate of substitution, right? or marginal product, diminishing marginal product, marginal productivity. All these are concepts uh, that make use of this way of reasoning at the margin. So I'm calling it marginless microeconomics. And the, respective of the textbook that you look at, most of them, or almost all of them, will only teach you about marginless microeconomics. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is uh, essentially this, that I'll put I've put together 13 points, which I think characterize marginless microeconomics. And in doing so, I'll raise some political questions. I'll raise some conceptual, some methodological, right? and um, some of a historical nature. So I'm going to bring in all these different aspects to illuminate what I think is marginless microeconomics. So this is a book uh, which is written by Krishna Bharadwaj uh, in the 1980s. So if one is interested in knowing more about the fact that there exists two kinds of microeconomics, economic theories, and if you look at the title of the book, it, it says classical political economy and rise to dominance of supply and demand theories. Right? What it suggests is that at one point of time, within classical political economy, there was a certain kind of microeconomics and macroeconomics like Kranti mentioned, we didn't use those terms. And then there was a shift, and now we have the supply and demand theories. What are the kind of political underpinnings there are in uh, microeconomics? Right? And this kind of a question is important because generally, let's say if you open Mankiw's book or Varian's book, it tells us that what we are going to do is positive economics. Right? And what we are not doing is normative economics. What we are doing is we are just going to explain the economy, how it is. So any kind of questions that students or teachers might have about political issues don't really get it. But however, my, my argument today will be that there are political underpinnings in marginless microeconomics and any kind of microeconomics for that matter. So one might wonder what, are, what is the issue with this? Why should one engage or debate these kinds of issues in microeconomics. There are important implications because, well, some of you might just do a BA or an MA in economics, and then you're going to get out and vote. You might uh, think that this kind of voting is better than that kind of voting. And some of it might be influenced by the kind of microeconomics that you learn. You might end up in policy making, you might end up in curriculum forming, or you might become teachers. Right? or any kind of collective politics which involves some kind of collectivization. And all of this has some basis or draws on microeconomics in some way or the other. And therefore it depends and it's important therefore to re realize what its core principles are, what the politics are and what the limitations are. And uh, the la I mean, I've presented this uh, once before and the question came, why am I focusing on this kind of microeconomics? And I thought that I'll add a slide uh, for two kinds of uh, groups of people. Often, many a time, teachers often have a PhD in economics, but as students, some of you might not decide to do a PhD in economics. Some of you might get into other career options. Right? So it could be that you go into the civil service or the corporate sector or the social sector or RBI or policy think tanks. And if that is the case, you're just going to stop your economic studies by reading Mankiw or Varian or some kind of variant of these kinds of books. 
there's no reason to do any kind of advanced engagement. However, there's a slight difference. If you are doing a PhD in economics today, uh, what we see is that there is a dominance of applied microeconomics or microeconometrics. Now here there is, a, there is a division that is made by practitioners between applied microeconomics and theoretical microeconomics. And very often there is not so much engagement with theory. So if uh, the more interested of you are going to look at some of these papers, you will notice that they are primarily driven by the econometric method and not so much by theory. Although there is a role for theory, which will get into it, how you explain what is happening. But this I think is also a cause for concern because what then is the role of theory? Now, can we do economics without any kind of theoretical underpinning? What about the role of theoretical debates? Now, today, if you learn microeconomics as opposed to macroeconomics, in macroeconomics, I think there is still some scope to have theoretical debates. But in microeconomics, I think that today it, be, it has become very difficult to engage in any kind of a theoretical debate. And what about the role of historical debates? Now, if you look at the history of any concept, let's say equilibrium, there have been, if you, I mean, if you trace it from the time of Adam Smith in 1776 to today, there have been different ways in which equilibrium has been characterized, equilibrium has been understood. Right? But very often, because we do not seriously engage with the history of economic ideas, we think that what we have today is the best kind of understanding of equilibrium. But these need not be at all. So now let me start off with a very, I mean, so I mentioned that this is a rationale for choosing this kind of, so I'm not going to get into what, uh, what might be considered advanced microeconomics today, which is being, which is a kind of research that is being done at the frontier. But what my focus today is really to look at what majority of students uh, in India or elsewhere study in an economics program and then go on to do various kinds of things. Right. So 13 points. And the first point I want to start with is the definition itself. The major definition appears to be taken from what Lionel Robbins proposed, which is to understand economics as a science of scarcity. So if we ask students today, again, what is economics? People might say that it is a science of choice or some kind of a science of scarcity. So what people seem to be doing today in microeconomics is that you want to optimize under some kind of constraints. This, I mean, it is in Lionel Robbins's uh, an essay on the nature and significance of economic science that he advances this definition. Right? So in general, one can argue that uh, what in micro or microeconomics today is largely understood as a science of choice or perhaps even economics mainstream economics as a whole. Right. As, and as I mentioned before, a science of constraint optimization. Alex, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, hi, this is Shobhadev. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. So most of the students here are essentially uh, Bachelor of Commerce students. Okay. And uh, we have students from BCom uh, with a focus on capital markets. Uh, so they are not essentially doing a major in economics. Economics is just taught as a part of the curriculum in the BCom program. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, okay. So I mean, then I mean, I think that if there are any questions or something is not clear, you can stop me at any point. Uh, but uh, Shomadi, would it be safe to assume that uh, most students might have done some economics in class eleven and twelve? Yes, they, they would have, and we are teaching them out of the core uh, textbook, uh, me and Professor okay. Anthony. Uh, so they are aware of marginalism and concepts as such, but they might not necessarily end up doing a uh, MA or a PhD in economics. So they, okay. they will mostly do a you know, CA or work in the corporate sector or the consultancy. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I, uh, the anyway, the concepts or the 13 points that I'm going to present is large largely basic and more foundational one. So I think that some of them may be familiar to you even from school uh, and some of it you might be studying now. So, but if there are any questions, yes, you can stop me and ask me at any point. Sure, sure, thank you. Yeah, so uh, 
so to begin with again we are going starting at the basic and uh, discussing the definition of economics itself right and it is largely understood as a science of scarcity and so then the question to ask let's say is labor scarce right now in a country like india or in general when there is migration does it make sense to assume that labor or workers are scarce right so these are i'm what i'm going to do through the lecture is to go into pose certain kind of questions which will provoke you or motivate you to think uh the kind of definition matters because it has an impact on our outlook on what we think uh, economics is about it has an impact on the kind of problems that we decide to work with and of course our focus and arguments and here i want to mention that there have been different definitions of economics throughout time and there is no reason to assume or presuppose that the lionel robbins's definition is the best definition and depending on if your definition changes right so kranti briefly mentioned political economy so within political economy you have a different definition of economics so when the definition of economics changes your outlook changes the kind of problem also change right so for instance in a country like india uh, where labor is in surplus does this kind of a science of constraint optimization makes sense or not so let me now move on to uh, labor and capital which are considered to be very basic and also considered to be factors of production and and i want to spend a little bit of time on how they are conceptualized and i think that whether you go into the corporate sector or whether you plan to work um, do chartered accountancy i think there's a little bit of economics that is always involved because people are trying to comprehend what is happening to the macro economy what is happening to your the markets around whether it's a stock market or any other kind of market so i think that these kinds of elementary conceptualizations become extremely important right so let's start with something very basic which is labor and capital and again in school and subsequently uh, it might you might have been taught that factors of production involve land labor and capital now as a student when this first comes to me i think that okay this makes sense because land is used in production labor is used in production and capital is used in production so it is okay to think of these factors of production in this form but one if one looks at the history of how this kind of conceptual categories came about the first time uh, the factors of production are being articulated in this way in the principles of economics by alfred marsh now before this what we had or what what we had before this was really categories such as capitalists workers land owners now this kind of a categorization within the economy also applies even today there is a very important difference between if you were to categorize the entire economy into capitalists and workers and land owners as opposed to land labor and capital right because within the factors of production you do not talk about which factor of production has more power than the others the way in which it is discussed in microeconomics is as if everything is on par and i've put uh, living and non living here because if we think of it uh, land in a particular sense can be considered to be non living and labor or labor power or workers in some i mean is, uh, we are talking about people right and capital refers to produced means of production so how do you how do you actually when we are thinking of factors of production is it legitimate is it okay to put the all these different kind of conceptual categories on par and let me just make one more point here that if we have a society where power is enforced in a particular way that is the land owners have more power than the capitalists or let's say the capitalists have more power than the workers this kind of a conceptualization makes it very difficult to accommodate for that unless we want to bring in additional assumptions as opposed to the political economy kind of uh, conceptualization where they talk about 
capitalist landowners and workers. Let me move on to the third point, which is about symmetry. Now, if you take a look at principles of economics and this diagram here, the graph, which is uh, one of the most famously famous graphs as to what identifies an economist, you see it that there is a upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve. Now, in mathematics or in general or in physics or in you know, natural sciences, there is a certain fascination with symmetry. Right? People like to find symmetry in uh, our surroundings. And so this is just to point out the symmetrical relationship between supply and demand. So what it says is that this supply and demand principle operates not just in the goods market, but it operates in the labor market, it operates in the financial market, and it operates in the land market. Essentially, this kind of a sub symmetrical supply and demand is supposed to operate in all the markets that we are looking at. And supply and demand are considered to be symmetrical forces. And the question that I want us to ponder here is the following. In natural sciences, it is probably okay to say that you're able to find symmetry in a particular behavior or in a particular rock or in a particular being. But when we are dealing with social truths or socioeconomic phenomena like unemployment or inflation or growth or inequality or ecological issues, can we say that these kinds of truths are characterized by symmetry or that this kind of a symmetrical formulation is the best formulation that we have. So this, again, to repeat, to reiterate my point that this kind of a symmetrical uh, exposition of supply and demand, again, seems to negate that there is some kind of a power relation within societies. And secondly, can we think of our markets in a different way? which is not characterized by these symmetrical forces of supply and demand functions. So I briefly spoke about marginalism at the very beginning, uh, when I mentioned that economists or ideas which use marginal concepts, such as marginal product, marginal revenue, etc., is what I call marginalist economics. This kind of a viewpoint was brought to the forefront when William Stanley Jevons is writing in the 1870s along with Walrus and Menger. So this, uh, the people, Jevons, Walrus and Menger, all three of them together are said to have brought about what is called the marginalist revolution. And this is in his classic work, The Theory of Political Economy. And I mentioned uh, Walrus and all of them are using these concepts of marginal cost, marginal revenue, and marginal product. And again, just I asked, like I asked previously, the question to ask is, do we reason at the margin? Because the assumption that is being made in marginalist economics is that everyone is reasoning at the margin, be it consumers, be it producers, and which is why uh, you talk about the marginal rate of substitution, or the marginal rate of technical substitution, MRS, MRTS, right? Marginal utility, marginal cost, all of these concepts suppose that we are reasoning at the margin. And I think it is very important to ask this question, do we reason at the margin? And you can also ask the question, should we reason at the margin? Is there anything in inherently or intrinsically favorable if we reason at the margin? And these are very important questions because very often the way in which microeconomics is set up, it makes us believe that probably we should all reason at the margin. And it also makes the claim that uh, we should, I mean, we reason at the margin, right? So one is a positive claim and the other is a normative claim. And I think that it's important that we critically interrogate both these kinds of uh, claims. And at least the way I would like to think of it is that human beings are influenced by and motivated by a plurality of human motivations and reasons. It's not that we only reason at the margin. 
maybe for years we might not reason at the margin or we might reason at the margin once in a while right so there is no reason to reduce human motivations to just of one kind just to argue that we reason at the margin now this part about utilitarianism again uh, many of you may might not be familiar with the philosophy of utilitarianism but one of the main people who uh, is associated with this idea of utilitarianism or the philosophy of it is john stuart mill this is the idea that people or individuals are fundamentally interested in maximizing utility and so, so the other people who are again who played an important role in utilitarianism are people like bentham and jevons i mean you might wonder you know why should one bother about the history of or why should one bother about utilitarianism when studying about microeconomics but i think that because in microeconomics textbooks there is no kind of history of ideas any more presented we often do not recognize the close relationship between the philosophy and the politics of utilitarianism and the economics that we study today this is john stuart mill's book utilitarianism and you would have studied in microeconomics some notion of marginal utility and or marginal rate of substitution and how they have a connection with how prices are formed in the economy again now suppose that you become a policy maker and you have to design an auction or you have to design a market for 5g how would you go about setting up this market some of it might come from your knowledge of what you have studied in microeconomics maybe right but then there are i mean there are important histories that one needs to be aware of like this history of utilitarianism what it essentially suggests is that prices or value is determined by utility of some kind and again if you're interested i would urge you to go and read more on utilitarianism and it is surprising that within microeconomics books we don't uh, deal with the history of utilitarianism or its politics or its philosophy because many of the concepts that we use today are drawn from that kind of a philosophy because of the influence of bentham mill and jevons and within political economy which is another kind of microeconomics you will see that there is a very different kind of determination of prices or value again the question to ask is what are the political implications if you replace utilitarianism with a different kind of philosophy are you able to arrive at a different kind of politics or a different kind of vision actually uh shomadeep is it okay if i ask a question to the students in between yes please do okay because i see that i mean i can't i can barely see people but i i, I think i can see some uh, tired faces so i thought let me ask a question so can you can at least two of you tell me how wages are determined or how you think uh, what determines wages Uh, yes, sir. This is Ravi. So I'd say wage would depend on the commission of a laborer on the piece rate system. That would be one way of defining the wage. Okay. Okay. So one is uh, some kind of commission, and uh, can you also say how that commission might be determined? So, for example, if a laborer works in a factory, like Trioni, Kanthi Ram is cleaning it. The number of match boxes the laborer makes in the factory, the number of boxes he makes. we paid on that so i'd say that's an example okay okay can i get one more response to uh, how wages are determined it's also probably determined by uh, the supply of labor in a particular market and the supply and the demand so that if there's a lot of supply the wage rate falls okay okay yeah thanks thanks so i think that what both of you said are slightly different but perhaps can be brought together right so uh, uh, when you said commission it means that somebody has to decide what kind of commission has to be given and that uh, depends on 
you know how powerful the worker is relative to let's say the employer so if the employer is much more powerful they can set a low rate of commission but if the workers or group of workers are somewhat more powerful they can set a high rate of uh, commission so there's a little bit of bargaining there and th this kind of an idea is more closer to the political economy way of understanding it whereas the second kind of response that came up is what um, i will just get in uh, supply and demand notion which is what is generally taught in mainstream economics books and which i'm calling as endogenous wage because you have the labor market you have the supply and demand and wages are determined endogenously endogenously within the market whereas the first case that we you know we just had a discussion about i would categorize that as exogenous wage because it is determined outside and it depends on the social order the political order and so on right so the dominant way of thinking about it is that uh, wages are determined in the labor market at the intersection of the labor supply and labor demand and the wage equals the marginal product of labor again don't worry too much about it if you haven't studied this already you might study it later and uh, there is also uh, maybe i don't want to get too much into it but this kind of an understanding of wages suggest that there is an inverse functional relationship between wages and the supply of labor and i think as one of you just mentioned it suggests this that if there are there is an increased supply of workers it is okay for wages to fall right so what this inverse functional relationship that wage equals function of labor actually does right is uh to me uh, it is some kind of an intellectual device of control or this is the way i would pose it because what we are saying is the following if an economy is labor surplus this kind of a theory makes it okay makes it legitimate for workers to get lower wages and what is the ju uh, justification that one can provide for it we can say that according to microeconomic theory it says that there is an inverse relationship between wage and uh, quantity of labor so if there are too many of you in the market it is completely legitimate for the wages to be less right so one needs to get a little more into what kind of i mean what is the kind of political implication uh, labor market or supply and demand thinking has on general employment and wage determination so all these concepts that we learn they have certain political implications and even something as simple as this which is that wage equals a function of labor it, it's a simple inverse functional relationship which can have far reaching effects and let me just give a different kind of a anecdote of a similar kind when we were ruled by the british and as many of you know we have we were faced with several famines and when uh, there was not enough food in the market some of the local uh, or nationalist indians went up to the administrators and told them that why don't you intervene in the market by providing us with more food the response was the following that according to mainstream economic theory markets will clear by itself so therefore there is no reason for me to intervene even if there is a famine because the food market will clear by itself right. now the reason why i have i mean i i shared this kind of a uh, this kind of a historical fact with you is because these conceptual tools whether it's microeconomics or any other kind of discipline have been used to various political ends so therefore as students of economics it's absolutely important that we are we have a critical relationship with all these theories that we learn and i mention ac pigou here because when keynes wrote his general theory in 1936 he was really criticizing uh, pigou's idea or theory of employment uh, have you studied the production function uh, can i just get a raise of hands is enough if you have studied the production function okay i see some hands being raised okay what production function essentially is about is it tells us how inputs 
get converted into outputs. And the simple kind of formulation that some of you may have seen is y equals a function of capital and labor, and a is a technology parameter. Right? Now, this uh, kind of an idea is very common in uh, microeconomics textbooks, and it is often sometimes used in macroeconomics as well, and sometimes also in growth theory. This idea of uh, production function was used to develop a theory of wage by somebody called John Bates Clark. If there are students who follow the Nobel Prize in economics, you might, some of you might know that there's also a Clark Medal, which is given to people who are of a younger age, J.B. Clark Medal. So this is um, in his name. There are some questions that can be posed here that the production function, the way it is generally uh, employed is to assume that inputs and outputs are separate. But very often we know that the output in some firm also goes as an input in some other firm. So are and outputs also inputs and how do we then think of a circular kind of production setup? The general way in which uh, this kind of a conceptual uh, apparatus thinks about A or technology is that it is always good. So if there's an improvement in technology, there is economic growth. But from the political economy tradition, uh, this kind of a viewpoint has been challenged because it really depends. One is that technology often has a capacity to make people unemployed. Uh, technology often has a capacity to lead to environmental damage, right? which can lead to uh, losses of loss in ability to work due to physical health reasons. And these have negative consequences therefore on, on uh, economy as well. So we cannot in general say that technological progress is always good. If one wants to really assess what is the impact of technology, it has to be studied in a more contextual sense. What is the nature of technology? How has it impacted people? And But this kind of a production function makes it easier for economists to suggest that technology is always beneficial. And uh, I'm going to ask a more slightly philosophical question, um, which is that, we I've spoken about functions earlier as well when I spoke about the link between wages and the quantity of labor. Now I'm talking about a function functional relationship between output and inputs. And these functional forms are, I mean, we have borrowed it from mathematics. Uh, the question to ask is functions presuppose certain kind of assumptions, right? That uh, there has to be a unique mapping and things like that. And it's a very strong claim to make. And the question that I'm going to leave you with is that how legitimate do you think the use of these functions are or these mathematical functions are when we are trying to understand human behavior, when we are trying to understand the society. So ontology in a way refers to how or uh, how we want to understand knowledge itself. Right? Because these functional forms are get going into our knowledge toolkit. Right? And so something again as elementary as a functional form, what are its implications? How do we use them? What are the limitations of their use in social sciences? The idea of diminishing returns, uh, again, I, I just want to get a, a quick hand raise. If you have come across diminishing returns to labor or capital. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, so again, uh, the idea that uh, there is diminishing marginal productive diminishing marginal productivity to capital is quite popular in microeconomics. But for anyone to derive this kind of diminishing marginal productivity, it is important to talk about potential change. Right? So what do I mean by potential change or marginal? It means that there is labor and capital. Suppose I keep labor constant and I increase one unit of capital, right? So we are not talking about what actually happens. We are talking about what can happen if I increase one more unit of capital. Right? So this is, I mean, this is what I mean by idea of potential change 
or the question that we are asking is what if not what is but what if what if we increase one more unit of capital now this is a again just like marginal this is a peculiar kind of reasoning that this is not the only way in which we can understand our surroundings but in microeconomics this is the dominant way in which we make sense of our economic surroundings now one can argue that this kind of a diminishing returns makes sense in the case of land that you know there is a certain patch of land and we keep on uh, utilizing it for production purpose and fertility falls uh, a similar kind of case has been made for labor and capital okay? but the question to ask here is if you are a rational entrepreneur and let's say that you have a pizza uh, oven no sensible entrepreneur is going to uh, put 10 workers to uh, make a pizza right because every machinery whether it's a pizza oven or an idli maker or something all of them have blueprints which says that okay you need two people to make this thing right so but what microeconomics sometimes tells us is that if we increase if we keep the pizza maker the same and if we keep on adding more and more workers after a point in time there will be diminishing returns and the question that i have is why will any sensible entrepreneur ever do this right it makes absolutely no sense so again this is a question to ask now if you don't have diminishing returns you will not be able to have certain properties for supply and demand curves and if you do not have those properties you will not have a certain kind of equilibrium many of you would have heard about the concept of efficiency and economists very often make use of this term efficiency and in the microeconomics concept uh, microeconomics concept you would have sorry context you would have studied pareto efficiency is uh, the is the idea of pareto efficiency familiar again uh, okay some some hands are up okay the claim in a way is that pareto efficiency is desirable in and of itself so if an equilibrium is con is characterized as pareto efficient economists would suggest that this is a good thing now what is happening here then is that we go to the actual market and we claim that this market is inefficient and therefore we need to make it more efficient and how do we go about it so what is happening uh, somewhat here is the idea of efficiency is actually within the realm of pure theory and right? pure i mean economic theory but these categories and ideas have often been used for policy purposes to claim that okay we want to make this policy more efficient or let me introduce this policy to make this sector more efficient and here i want to highlight how powerful ideas are because the idea of efficiency has a particular history and how it has been used and how it has been of course misused right so again if one is interested in this these kinds of questions right and now uh, this uh, paper uh, by bromley which is titled the ideology of efficiency searching for a theory of policy analysis talks about how efficiency has been used or misused to make certain kind of policy considerations and i've also put another article here which is which has a more history of economic thought kind of approach as to the link between competition and efficiency and if you trace back the history of uh, marginalist economics or neoclassical theory you will be surprised to see that very some of the ideas that today we think are settled has a very kind of not violent but a complex history because there have been various kinds of debates that have gone on and again because we don't engage so much with history we forget that uh, this kind of a debate used to exist but what a reading of all this seems to suggest is that efficiency is defined in a very narrow sense of the term and there is no particular reason to think that efficiency is a desirable policy goal and also the question arises 
even if somebody claims that it is desirable, uh, the question to ask is, who is it desirable for? Again, this is a concept that uh, most students uh, in economics study, whether in school or later, the assumption of perfect competition. And I'm sure that when you were studying it, you would have also asked this question, why are we studying it? Because I don't see perfect competition anywhere in the world. Did any of you have that kind of a response when you studied perfect competition? Okay, I can see one or two hands up. Uh, maybe let me just get a couple of responses from people who haven't spoken. Uh, if you have studied perfect competition, you know, what are your general feelings or thoughts about it? I'll just uh, wait for two responses. So, Alex, I don't think I've studied perfect competition like markets yet, then you have to come, but there are some sense of what a perfect competition is. Okay. So, have you, I mean, uh, I saw two hands or something which, uh, which went up on perfect competition, no? Or I don't know if I was imagining. Yeah, yeah, so this one student. Yeah. Um, so, so, like, perfect competition, like, it wasn't exactly like that it's non existent as such. Our teachers explained to us, like, you know, like, uh, like certain uh, goods and services, like, for example, let's take wheat or something. Uh, it, it has certain, uh, like, features or characteristics of a perfect competition. Like, it has a large number of buyers and sellers. It's a huge market on its own. But, like, like the, like the people or the price, there's no price makers as such, it's just price takers. So there was always like an example for something. And like since we got in, like, you know, like there isn't anything that uh, our daily goods and services, like food itself, could be categorized into. We assume perfect competition would fall into something. And like these goods would fall into those, into the perfect competition category. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, is there, I mean, there was, was there one more hand or that that's it? Uh, so for us, they told us it's a hypothetical situation because there is nothing as perfect competition because uh, the market, it, it is not possible that everyone in the market knows everything. So, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. So one, one response was that, I mean, there is a way to think of some markets as having some elements of perfect competition and the other way that has been uh, taught to you is that it is a hypothetical kind of uh, setting. So uh, if, I mean, the, okay, first of all, the, let me just give you let people who haven't uh, studied it yet, but this is the basic or the most uh, basic setup in which economics is generally articulated. The assumption is there are a large number of buyers and sellers. There is perfect information and the firms are price takers. These are some of the basic assumptions of uh, and uh, perfect competition. Right. Uh, and this is there in your microeconomics and some variant of it will be there in your macroeconomics. The way in which perfect competition is generally set up is that it's as a static thing. Now, if you think of one of the characteristic features of perfect competition is that prices are, sorry, firms are price takers, right? Firms are price takers. But if we Im imagine competition, entrepreneurship, competitiveness, we would think that firms are constantly changing their prices and are able to make these uh, price changes, right? And in a more dynamic sense. So one of the, at least uh, when I was studying this or when uh, some of us were studying it, some of the kind of dis dissatisfaction that we had was competition was reduced to a static concept, whereas competition in the real world is a dynamic one. So how do you make sense of this um, static versus dynamic thing? And I think that to assume that there are large number of buyers and sellers or this kind of uh, perfect competition uh, or perfect information, all of them seem to suggest that they are largely artificial. And I will come to the point that you made about hypothetical, right? Because in a way that anything that we say is artificial or hypothetical, means that it's not fully realistic. But the reason I'm saying that it is artificial is because, again, the principles of competition is that 
firms are dynamic firms are able to change their price behavior their quantity behavior and their strategies and that is what makes um, what what how we understand competition right so it is true that it is a hypothetical setup and when we talk about imperfect competition or monopoly we are thinking of monopoly as or monopolistic competition or imperfect competition as a deviation from perfect competition right so we might think that the economy is actually oligopolistic because of various reasons but our understanding of oligopoly comes from how we understand perfect competition because imperfect competition is a deviation from perfect competition and this is why i think that it's important that to be critically evaluate perfect competition because it provides a benchmark and in fact uh, again some of this you might study later there is some notion called deadweight loss the idea of deadweight loss is also defined based on the analytical benchmark of perfect competition so the idea of efficiency also is related to how we define perfect competition so again uh, the questions uh, which i'm going to leave you with here for this under this uh, uh, slide is why do we make these assumptions is it for mathematical reasons now even if they are for mathematical reasons what do they provide us is it that they allow us to have an equilibrium or what is the basis or why do we have to make these kinds of static assumptions Uh, again this might i mean uh, again how many of you have heard of public goods uh you might have read in the newspaper sometimes or on social media that education is a public good right okay so this concept of public good is also largely within the mainstream microeconomic theory and it falls under what is called externalities and externalities refer to whatever the price mechanism is not really able to absorb or incorporate anything outside that is considered to be externalities what is, i mean why do i uh, say that there is some kind of politics of public good the way in which microeconomics books generally set it up is the following that the primary responsibility of provision of any kind of good rests with the market how we understand it uh, but if the market fails the government should step in right so if, if if i mean people do argue that education is a public good but what is the actual claim, implicit claim there that because of externalities the market is not able to price education properly therefore education is a public good and the and the government should provide it. but again this is just one way of understanding provision right? now if a group of us thinks that care work should be provided by the government or by the state or by the community there is no reason to bring in microeconomic uh, uh, logic or argumentation to say that because of such and such reason this has to be provided right? so the way in which we approach the provision of various goods and services need not always come through an economic reason and this kind of a uh, idea of public good is not i mean they are not able to capture it fully in the core uh, pricing mechanism they need to accommodate it through externalities and that's why i call it it's outside the core marginalist edifice so just two more points before i uh, end with some conclusions the the philosophical idea of methodological individualism is an extremely important one right in microeconomics the claim is that you are studying how an individual operates but what you are actually studying or what you are actually saying is the following that if you want to study how prices are formed in the economy if you want to study how wages are determined in the economy the fundamental unit of analysis is an individual let me repeat that if you want to study how prices are determined if you want to study how wages and profits are determined the fundamental unit of analysis 
is an individual. This, this is a philosophical position right, that you're taking. Now, in multiple schools of economic thought, there are different ways to study prices. There are different ways to study wages. It is not always necessary to start with an individual as the basic unit. Right? So I've just uh, put my book here only because even when talking about macroeconomics, there is a particular group of uh, macroeconomists who believe that the macroeconomy can be understood by studying an individual and the macroeconomy can be understood as a summation of these individual ideas. Now, this kind of a view was rejected by people like Keynes, Kalitsky, and others who argued that this is not correct or there is something called the fallacy of composition. That is, the logic of the macroeconomy or the system has a different logic from the logic of that of the individual. Now, under methodological individualism, you also assume that preferences are independent, which implies that the individual is an asocial individual. And these kinds of ideas are actually applied to institutions, are applied to public policy, often in the name of public choice theory. Right? So these kinds of political underpinnings are there in many kinds of economic um, themes or economic, I mean, not schools, but fields of economics that are there, which are then used for policy making. And again, as I mentioned before, Within the political economy tradition, the fundamental unit of analysis is a group or a class. And so for them, you can determine prices, wages, profits, starting from a social class. And not you don't have to necessarily start from an individual. So this is the last point, which is about, I started by talking about positive and normative economics. And conventional books of microeconomics suggest that what you've been taught is positive economics or what is. Right? Positive economics refers to what is happening and normative economics refers to what ought to be the case. Now, this kind of a separation between positive and normative economics itself is problematic. And I would say that there is more of a dialectical relationship between positive and normative economics because both of them influence each other. Now, why do I say that? In 2021, you know, you've studied certain economics and tomorrow you are in policy making. Right? So what you, what you studied, you think that this is how the economy should function and you are going to employ that. So tomorrow, if somebody studies that same economy, then you're going to answer a positive question, right? So because policy is central to the way in which we understand how economies function, what is normative today becomes positive tomorrow, right? And there is some sort of a interrelationship between the two because when we see what kind of economics is happening, we also want to make changes to it. Right? So there is some sort of a dialectical relationship between the two, which also suggests that ideas matter. It's not that you know we study these ideas in the classroom and we forget about them. Many a times consciously or often unconsciously, they have an impact on our behavior on or the kind of choices or the kind of policy prescriptions that we uh, suggest. So one can argue that theories really matter. Because again, today, because of the availability of big data and a lot of programming, a lot of uh, data really being available, one thinks that theories are not very important. Right? But actually, if you look at any kind of work that is being published or written about, it can be traced to one or the other schools of economic thought. And therefore, theories do matter. So let me just do a quick uh, recap. We spoke about how the definition is important. Uh, if you start from a science of choice definition, you have a particular way of understanding the world. Labor and capital understood as factors of production conceals the power structure in the economy. There is no reason to think that social truths are characterized by symmetry or symmetry is the best way of understanding social truths. Uh, marginalism makes use of peculiar ways of reasoning at the margin and 
human beings are motivated by a plurality of um, reasoning and motivations the history and philosophy and politics of utilitarianism is extremely important when one studies uh, marginless microeconomics the idea that wages are endogenously determined by supply and demand uh, makes or forms a particular kind of intellectual control to keep the wages low especially in labor rich countries like india the idea of the production function also we question whether to what extent these mathematical functions are useful and that technology may not always be a good thing the idea of diminishing returns uh, again makes use of certain kind of i think uh, or irrational assumptions where we you know keep one factor constant and assume another factor increasing the idea of efficiency as a policy or as a desirable policy must be challenged and one needs to look at its history the idea of perfect competition as an analytical benchmark is an important one and therefore we need to critically evaluate it more closely public goods uh, is viewed or public goods has a particular connection with the idea of perfect competition and efficiency which needs to be looked at in that context and we need to have other ways of talking about the right to food or the right to care uh, or the right to housing without bringing in economic kind of a reasoning methodological individualism presupposes that all economic phenomena has to be studied by looking at the individual as a basic unit but this is just one way of understanding the world and there are many other philosophical approaches to it and finally that normative and positive economics are interrelated right now to uh, two slides of conclusion i think what i try to do with this talk is to highlight that there are certain political implications for all of these concepts which might look benign or scientific or positive right but if one engages or reads the history of marginalist economic thought a critical history then it becomes clear what its politics are and this also suggests that i think that for anyone i don't think that this only applies to honor students in economics but to anyone who wants to make sense of our economic surroundings it's important that we read politics and philosophy along with political economy to have a better understanding right and as i mentioned before ideas matter whatever kind of politics that one might be interested in whether it's of the individual kind or the collective kind it is only some kind of different kind of ideas coming together that we are able to ask and see uh, something that is not maybe worked so far but we can articulate it and of course ideas matter in policy recommendations and when some of you enter policy making as well so here it becomes then important to talk a little bit about in the classroom or how uh, textbooks are decided because i think a critical pedagogy is becomes important where students experiences are also taken into account history is spoken about uh, phil philosophy is discussed right? and i think that in any kind of uh, economic uh, you know maybe sub discipline or sub group whether it's microeconomics or macroeconomics there are different schools of thought and it is important that students especially or you are exposed to multiple schools of thought so that you can make a choice this is what i mean by pluralism and just as two book recommendations for those who might be interested uh, these are microeconomics books which are written challenging marginalist economics so one is by Frederick Lee title post keynesian price theory so it only focuses primarily on post keynesian price theory and questions marginless price theory the other book by fabio petri microeconomics for the critical mind looks at both main uh, marginless and non marginless approaches but this is a slightly advanced book and i mean if you are interested in a phd or something more advanced i would recommend this but otherwise i would uh, maybe recommend uh, lee's post keynesian price theory but both of them suggest to you that there are different kinds of microeconomics which explains how prices wages and profits are determined so i'll stop here thank you
Thank you, Alex, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think some of the concepts that you discussed, the students are still not, uh, you know, they're not completely familiar uh, with those. But uh, most of the 13 that you mentioned, I've actually taught them, and Professor Anthony has actually taught the class. So I hope this provokes some thought. So I just wanted to add my two cents if I could. So the one thing is when we teach microeconomics the way I am teaching or she's teaching, uh, it seems that there's a bunch of graphs, there's a bunch of facts that we are presenting to you, uh, and uh, it's kind of devoid of any politics or any implications in the real world. And I hope that's not too much of the case, but the politics and economics are kind of intertwined. Right? So economic policy uh, and politics are they go hand in hand, which is where political economy comes in. Right? So Professor Alex mentioned. Uh, the, the 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 theme of the talk is the politics of microeconomics, right? So you have to understand that uh, what we are studying, it's, it does not exist in, in a vacuum in space. It exists in the society, right? So I hope I hope you at least got that out of the talk, right? And uh, I hope this makes you think a little bit more about what we study. The book that we are using, the core textbook, is already a critical way of looking at. Uh, economics uh, and it's a, I did not have this book when I was an undergraduate student, right? So I wish uh, we did. Um, um, so I hope this provokes some thought in your mind so that you find economics a little bit more interesting when you study it here uh, and later. Uh, are there any questions uh, you'd like to ask, Alex? Thanks, Patra. I uh, I really liked your and I really liked the presentation. Um, I you sort of posed a question in the beginning of the presentation about why at the PhD level um, economic theory is discussed. Um, I started thinking about that while with the presentation as well. Uh, could it possibly because I think you mentioned your conclusion as well that um, we're sort of deeply entrenched in sort of like one particular paradigm. Uh, of economics within our high school or even our graduation degree that we sort of internalize the paradigms of economics that we learn then. And then that sort of takes us on to our PhDs where in the scholarly environment where we're forced to uh, give continuously produce papers and publications where we choose to just um, apply those models without really critically assessing them or, or say moving or playing with the models in general. So, would you say that's a product of a sort of tutorial college setting where dialogue is not part of an economic classroom? Or is it something else? Is it a failure of Indian methods of, not maybe Indian, my context is Indian. Is that the failure of how economics is taught? Okay, you've asked a very, I mean, I think a difficult question, but I, I'll just try to respond in the, so I, I, I certainly agree with you that I think that we, when we are trying to think of uh, these questions, we have to also think of how knowledge is being produced uh, and how knowledge is being disseminated. And if you think of how knowledge is being produced, largely we think of universities as spaces where research is conducted and research is being published. And if you think of how knowledge is being disseminated, uh, it is again through journal articles, writing books, but also in the classroom, right? And you're right in uh, saying that if we do not have a culture of debate, it could be in the classroom, it could be, let's say in a public forum, uh, there is a consequence to it and there is a negative consequence to it. It is that we think that, we might think that there's only one way of understanding the world. And the way in which I think of this is, that the way economics is generally taught across the world. I don't think that this is particular to India. In fact, I think at least 
So in, I mean, from my limited understanding, I would say that uh, Indian universities are slightly better off because there is a culture among students generally, even if not in the classroom so much, but outside the classroom to debate and discuss and all that. But the way in which economics has become, unfortunately, is that there is, you know, just certain kinds of things that are considered to be acceptable, right? So if you work uh, within the mainstream economics, you have to use a certain method to be published. But if you're working in a different tradition, you will not be published in the top journals. And if you're not published in the top journals, you don't get promotion and so on and so forth, or you don't get grades. So that's, I think that's one large part of the issue is how universities and knowledge producers and disseminators are organized. But if you, I mean, I, I'm, and let me just take a slightly step back and think about it, which is that, let's say from the time that Adam Smith is writing, right? when Adam Smith and David Ricardo were writing, their ideas were considered to be dominant. But around that time, there were also people like J.B. Say, who were famous for Say's Law, who wrote Supply Creates Its Own Demand, who has a different paradigm altogether from that of Adam Smith and Ricardo. So the fact of the matter is that as long as there are human beings, there will always be different paradigms. There will always be different schools of thought because all of us are coming from you know, different ways of understanding the world. So different schools of thought existed since the time economists have spoken about it. And what you see most visibly from reading the history of economic thought is debate. Smith is arguing with uh, Ricardo, uh, sorry, Ricardo is arguing with Smith, Ricardo is arguing with J.B. Say, Marx is arguing with Ricardo, Keynes is arguing with his teacher, Marshall, Keynes is arguing with Pigou. Debates are central to any kind of, I think, knowledge production or understanding. But unfortunately, today, it seems to me that the role of debate has been minimized, or what you mentioned, dialogue, in some sense. Right? Because now the claim is that this is what is economics and this is what you have to do. So that makes me very uncomfortable. Right? So, and therefore uh, textbooks, I mean, I didn't have that slide today, right? Textbooks are written by somebody who has a particular standpoint. Now, what is that standpoint? Are they saying that there are different schools of thought? Are they saying there's only one way to do economics? Is there only one kind of method uh, to do economics, which looks at only quantitative data? Is there a role for uh, you know, case studies, qualitative data? So I think, I mean, and I don't think there is a single answer to this question. And I feel as time goes on, we have to uh, evaluate and assess the surroundings and, you know, and our answer also. But I think this is an extremely important question uh, to keep asking and to keep answering. So thank you for asking that question. Um, follow up question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, what advice would you give to an economic student that's sort of trying to exit this paradigm to say, uh, introduce the theory of waste to production function or to sort of deal with um, ecological economic problems or energy and environmental economic problems or even the issue of introducing the long run at time in economics? Um, how, what kind of advice would you give to an economic student on how to sort of uh, introduce different paradigms and work for them? So, I mean, you mentioned environmental economics. So one can study environmental economics from a marginalist paradigm. You can study it from a Marxian paradigm or a marginalist paradigm, or you can do feminist economics from any of these paradigms, because I mean, these are themes that we are studying and you can study it from any paradigm. So what my suggestion would be is to, let's say, go to the library uh, and read up on what these different paradigms have written about, or people from these different paradigms have written about, about these different themes that you're interested in, and see what is most convincing to you. Right? So I think that, I mean, my the uh, purpose of this lecture really is to point to you that there are different schools of thought, even in microeconomics. Uh, and that if you engage with them, you might prefer one over the other. But the choice of the paradigm cannot be made at the level of the textbook or at the curriculum. 
but it has to be made by the students. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, I'm Thank you for the talk. It's really enjoyable. So, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, so uh, something that you said during the talk really caught my attention, uh, which is the properties of mathematical functions and the way that that mapped. Uh, so something I've noticed as a criticism of a lot of mathematical modeling in economics is that uh, precisely this, which is you can't map everything onto a particular function that might be circular mappings in a lot of cases. So I was wondering if you could comment or give your opinion about uh, shifting the paradigms of mathematical philosophy. So what I'm trying to say is uh, calculus uh, that is normally used in subjects such as economics or physics is a particular realm of mathematical philosophy. Now, what if we shift our modeling philosophy to something, say, a little more advanced? like category theory, which talks about groups or classes, not necessarily um, in the way that we think of operations in mechanistic math. So if you could give some yeah. of so, so I think I would start by, you know, um, discussing this in this way that the question uh, I would have, I would ask is why are we studying calculus primarily? And the reason we are studying calculus primarily is because we have supply and demand functions which are convex and easily differentiable. Right? So the choice of mathematics that we study is determined by the dominant paradigm. And secondly, just like there are schools of thought in economics, there are schools of thought in mathematics. Now, Today, the way in what kind of mathematics is taught to you is based on what is dominant in economics. But ideally, I would say that, I mean, I think mathematics is an important tool. Ideally, one should be exposed to different schools of thought in mathematics. And then again, the student should be choosing the mathematical operation that is most suitable for the question that you're asking or the framework that you have adopted. Right? But that is not at all how it is happening uh, today. And the third point is whenever we, you know, we translate concepts or ideas from pure maths to any applied field. Now, this could be biology, this could be uh, ecology, or it could be economics. I think we need to be extremely mindful. And I think this question of how it gets translated and their <laughs> mathematical philosophy or the philosophy of mathematics plays a role. And I, my only thing is that we have to be extremely cautious and be aware of what are the possible limitations or po possible pitfalls that this kind of a translation has. And this is not just for economics, this is for biology, this is for any kind of field which applies uh, concepts and conclusions from pure maths. So overall, again, my uh, general suggestion is that there are different schools of uh, thought in mathematics, different paradigms in mathematics, Explore them and see what uh, might be might uh, make more sense to you. Any questions? Okay, so I have a question for you, Alex, if you don't mind. Um, so if I am to incorporate this uh, of the 13 things uh, in, uh, in, the, in an undergraduate uh, course, uh, what is the, you know, maybe one or two readings that I could incorporate uh, at the undergrad level? Because I think the books that you mentioned there are a little bit advanced, I think. Uh, uh, something that I could uh, use in my own class. Okay, so this I will have to think about and uh... Uh, tell, because this is a first year or a second year, first year course, right? First year, yeah, it's in the first semester itself. Yeah, first semester. So, yeah, I will, this will involve some thinking on my part, at least I don't have anything offhand. Uh, but so just to, because I mean, uh, the, uh, the reason that I think core does not, what core does is that it puts together different schools of thought. So it has elements from Nash, it has elements from Marx, it has elements from Keynes. Hayek, everything together. So 
uh, it's very difficult i think as a reader for anyone to know what are the different kind of uh, contributions or how they might differ so i think yeah when teaching core i'm just wondering uh, what is a more helpful pedagogical aid to give but let me think about it and get back to sure, sure. 